on the whole idea of prevention. We had over 600 submissions and uh, the team are analysing them now and very shortly we will publish them and our plans for our areas of focus as this inquiry progresses throughout this part of this year. What I can tell you is that they're very broad, so from some more obvious stuff from obesity and smoking to, to mental health and from clean air, uh, which we'll definitely come on to today, to healthy homes, healthy workplaces, um, and there'll be different work streams within that. Uh, I guess today we couldn't really start with a more top level than our main guest, who, who is uh, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, he's the Chief Medical Officer, who is very well known. Um, in any way, but certainly very well known because of his high profile role during the COVID pandemic. And uh, thank you for all your work on that, Chris. Um, we also are joined by Jonathan Maru, uh, who's heading up the Office for Health uh, Improvement and Disparities at the Department of Health and Social Care, and Dr. Janelle Deguchi, who's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for England. Thanks very much for joining us and giving evidence to us today to kick off this important inquiry. Um, Professor Whitty, if I could start with you. The NHS is is never out of the headlines, as, as you know. Um, the strikes, obviously another strike announced yesterday by potentially by junior doctors about money, but as much we hear anyway about the system and the sheer demand on it, which of course hit staff very hard. Uh, we heard from GMB Union just before Christmas about 10 times the number of calls coming into the ambulance service. We, the Secretary of State told us about 100 times the number of people in hospital with flu this winter. Um, we know the NHS in England spends more than £10 billion a year dealing with diabetes care. And there are so many more examples, obviously. Can I ask you as to start this session, to start this inquiry, in your view as our Chief Medical Officer, is the NHS sustainable in the future without a complete step change in how we prevent ill health? Or can be called early, at which point it's a lot easier, uh, much more pleasant or at least less unpleasant to treat and indeed cheaper to treat than if it's dealt with earlier. This is all the work of prevention. There are clearly then things we can do in terms of the NHS itself, how it's run, which I think is for, for obviously for other points in your inquiries. And then finally, and importantly, there's the issue of uh, people who need social care following the NHS, which again is a very major part of the issue. All three of those are important, but I'm going to, you know, this, this session is about the first of those, prevention. Yes. Prevention has an absolutely uh, massive role in some diseases, uh, has a significant role in some, and has almost no role in others. And it's important to lay those out, I think. And that's what I'd really just like to do in my first few comments, and then we can take any of them in detail. Um, let's start off with an example of a disease which is almost entirely preventable, not completely, it's about 79% preventable. Uh, I'll take two, two cancers. Um, and there are different sorts of prevention. The first cancer I'll take is cervical cancer, in young, largely in young women. Uh, this is something which we now can uh, prevent almost all deaths if we look 10, 10 to 30 years to the future, mainly by vaccination, because this is something which is driven by infection, and also by screening, because screening uh, allows us to pick it up at such an early stage it can be treated incredibly quickly as a day case, really minimal uh, trauma for the women involved relative to if it goes on later. Mm. Uh, and Cancer Research UK would say this is essentially now 99% preventable once we look out to the future, uh, once the cohort of uh, girls who are vaccinated turn into women uh, and uh, into the period of, at risk. And then another cancer which is uh, highly preventable uh, is lung cancer. Lung cancer is our number one killer of a cancer. It's a horrible way to die. Most people who are diagnosed die within a year, uh, very unpleasantly. 79% uh, of all lung cancers are preventable. The great majority of that is caused by smoking. Uh, and then there are also some additional issues in terms of industrial processes and some issues in terms of uh, air pollution uh, as well. But the big one really is smoking. If smoking disappeared, the great majority of this, the worst of our cancers would just disappear. At the other extreme, uh, the most common uh, cancer in men, prostate cancer, uh, there is nothing that we currently know that can be done actually to prevent it. There isn't an effective screening mechanism. There is no preventive systems. This is really all about early diagnosis and treatment. So I'm just making the point that there is a variety, depending which disease you're talking about. 
but that actually the majority of the largest diseases we worry about, the cardiovascular diseases, heart, heart, heart attacks and cardiovascular disease strokes, uh, most of the cancers, for example, breast cancer, bowel cancer, we can either prevent them substantially uh, or at least to a large enough degree to make a very big difference to people's lives and to the NHS. So there's a lot we can do. Just to take uh, a, uh, two examples of MHA, and then I'll obviously leave it to... And if you can bring in the, the point I'm making about sustainability of yes, the NHS, I, I, so, given demand, where yeah, it is. exactly. So I'm going to take the, the, the example I'm going to use is coronary heart disease. Uh, when I was training in medicine, uh, coronary heart disease dominated the medical take to a very large degree. 50% of people uh, back uh, in the 60s, I, I'm not that old, but uh, back in the 60s would have died of coronary heart disease in the UK. That rate has gone down to 25% of people will die of uh, heart, heart disease or cardiovascular disease now. That's a vast improvement, but actually also people are not getting the unstable angina the major events that have put them into the, the NHS in the first place. Now, what, what has led to that improvement? It's broadly three sets of things. There's primary prevention. That's things which are done to everybody. We all, as society, do them. They have to be uh, directed by political leaders who are elected. It's a societal choice. That's things like reducing smoking, reducing salt, uh, allow, improving areas for people to, to exercise, a variety of things which could be done to everybody, and that improves the cardiovascular health of the whole population. Uh, um, then you have secondary prevention, and that's things which is done based on someone's individual risk. And these are, this is true for all the diseases, but I'm taking heart disease as uh, the example. And those are things like identifying that someone has hypertension, putting them on antihypertensive, they've got high cholesterol, they're on a cholesterol-lowering drug, or indeed they're individually smoking and helping them individually to come off because we fail to prevent uh, smoking uh, in the first place. And then finally, there's treatment, uh, and that's the bit which is, in a sense, that's beyond this uh, inquiry. But that, the primary prevention probably was the principal reason for the big reductions we saw in cardiovascular disease from the 60s through to uh, around about the 80s, and increasingly then secondary prevention became important. And if you look at people dying of heart disease, this is per 100,000 uh, over time, uh, for men that's dropped from 1,280-ish to about 300 now. That's a very substantial uh, improvement. Mm. Uh, and in women, it's dropped from about 889 down to 210 over that time period. And that's made up of a combination of lots of steps on primary prevention, lots of steps on secondary prevention, and improved treatment. Mm. It's when you put those together that you then get significantly better health and much less pressure on the NHS. So you have to kind of think there are lots of things we do in primary, lots of things we do on secondary, and lots of things we do on treatment. Medicine is made up of lots of incremental steps, but a very large proportion of them for most diseases are on the preventative side. And then the final thing uh, just to highlight is that within the UK, the prevention that we have is very badly distributed around the population. Mm. So if you look at our most deprived areas, the uh, period of time people live in ill health and indeed how long they live is very significantly lower than our most affluent areas. That's clearly not biologically necessary. So to take uh, a, a well-known example, uh, in, in, in Blackpool, for example, people live uh, eight years shorter on average, varies hugely around the, around the city, it's a lot of hierarchy, uh, at, but also more importantly in many ways, they live 19 years, uh, f fewer years in good health. So they also therefore are living their lives in a very constrained way, and this is due to preventable things. And I'll just take two examples of that and then I'll, I'll sort of see where the committee wants to go. One of them is smoking. Smoking which drives a large proportion of the cardiovascular disease, the strokes and the heart attacks, a large proportion of the cancers, not just lung cancer, but esophageal cancer, bladder cancer, many other cancers. Uh, that is uh, twice as high, usually in people in lower incomes, twice, more than twice as high in people living with mental health issues. The cigarette industry goes absolutely unerringly for the most vulnerable in society. Mm. And you have a situation where uh, the, a great majority of people who smoke uh, will have taken up smoking uh, before they are 18, and the, almost all of them will have taken up smoking before they are 20, i.e. the cigarette industry goes to the most vulnerable teenagers. And it aims to addict them at that stage of their lives, and then when they find they can't come off, uh, they're, they're hooked. 
Most people who smoke don't want to smoke. This is framed by the cigarette industry as an issue of choice. Actually, they have deliberately taken the most vulnerable children uh, and people in society and taken their choice away from them by addicting them at an early stage of their life. So that's one of the reasons the, the, the difference in deprivation. Uh, the sec the, a second one uh, is issues of obesity. So if you look at obesity uh, in uh, reception year, uh, if you look at the uh, highest and the lowest socioeconomic uh, groups, uh, at reception it would be 13, living, people living with obesity would be a bit over 13% in the most deprived areas uh, and about 6% in the least deprived areas. By the time we get up to uh, year six, and remember these are still young children, it's 30% uh, in uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the most deprived areas and about uh, between 13 and 14 percent in the least deprived areas. That's just two big drivers of ill health. So it's very heavily skewed towards areas of deprivation. I'll stop there, Chair, and take it in any direction you want. Do you worry about the NHS and its, its, its viability given the trajectory that we're on? Because all the things you said about obesity, all the things you said about smoking, they're not being turned around, they're continuing. So do you worry, as CMO, about the viability of the NHS if it continues to have this level of demand into it? Uh, my, my, in a sense, my job is to try and see if we can improve it, and I think what is really clear is we can on this. On smoking, we can definitely improve things. We can improve things on air pollution. We might want to come back to that. Mm. Uh, we can improve things on exercise. There's lots of things we can do to do that. Obesity is the one that is going in the wrong direction on this one. It's a very major cause of multiple diseases. So that's a very <coughs> significant one to aim for. But there are certainly things we can do to turn that uh, tide that has been going up uh, uh, down over time. So uh, you know, my view is these preventable things can all be uh, turned around if there is the will to do so. Okay, and so that's what I guess we're trying to get at, is, yeah. is, is there. So in the, the British Medical Journal this month, you, you called for secondary prevention services to be restored and extended post-COVID. If I, if I look at your annual conference speech to the Local Government Association last uh, a year ago next month, you said that many areas of public health had, quotes, either trodden water or gone backwards since the beginning of the pandemic. And you were referring specifically, I think, to smoking, obesity, alcoholism uh, as growing public health issues. You, are, you called for a long-term and local approach to prevention. So the Secretary of State seems to agree with you that prevention is central to his mission. I wonder whether you think it is central to his mission and to this government's mission. I think if you think about the primary prevention and the secondary prevention, I think it definitely should be. Uh, and the Secretary of State has made clear he says it is, and uh, the Prime Minister has said it is. Uh, the primary prevention issues are largely ones of political choice. Yes. So that is really in this building, the, the decisions, and in local authority uh, elected leaders as well, where decisions around things like smoking are made. So that is a political choice. And then there are issues of secondary prevention, which is what I was writing, talking about in the, in the BMJ. That is mainly around the distribution of resources in the NHS, mm. uh, in the broadest sense. So they're not just doctors and nurses, but also pharmacists, physios, uh, others who work in the system. Uh, certainly my view would be, and I think this is shared by most people, and this is the reason the NHS have uh, very much swung behind this, is putting more resource into that secondary prevention with the NHS would be a good investment for the future because it would help to slow down the speed of the hamster wheel which otherwise goes ever mm. faster and we really need to put a lot of emphasis on that area of medical care nursing care widest uh, health care as well as in a sense making the case politically uh this is for ministers clearly to do uh that there are choices to be made on primary prevention and if Parliament chooses to uh, enact some of the things it could do, we could improve things like air pollution, reduce things like smoking, uh, and reduce the risks of obesity in the most vulnerable. So those are political choices. But, it's, but it's self-evident that those choices are not being made to the extent that you would like. Correct. Okay. My job is to make the case that public health is important. So unsurprisingly, I think these are very important issues. Yes. And then just finally, just in five minutes or so, then I'm going to bring in James Morris, who wants to talk to you about mental health. Um, your annual report last year made air pollution and its effect on health its central <coughs> pillar of, of the report. It was good to see. And I know you've been in Parliament this morning talking to the all-party group about exactly that. Um, 
We have a major issue with air pollution in this country, and it's driver of cardiovascular disease, and you've made the link with cancer. I just wonder if you would give us some of your thoughts on air pollution and how much of a low-hanging fruit that could be. Because, yes, we're interested in long-term preventative health measures, but we're also interested in what can we do in the short term to be able to do it. So one of the points that the report made, um, I hope reasonably clearly, is that we have had an extraordinary improvement in air pollution over the last 30 to 40 years. And the two things that drive that uh, broadly are engineers and politicians. It's, it's a combination of those, those two groups uh, who can, can lead on this. So if you late, take transport, for example, um, every decade the amount of uh, nitrogen oxides and particulate matters has gone lower through cars as we move to electrification. Nitrogen oxides in transport will virtually disappear uh, from at least the, the light vehicle fleet. Um, there will still be issues of particulate matter from brakes and particularly tyres, and they need to be dealt with. But there have been significant improvements. Uh, there have been major improvements in ind industrial emissions uh, of um, air pollutants. Uh, but uh, we have not had the same kind of improvements in agriculture, and that's, a, that's not a trivial issue, but probably not one at this point in the, the inquiry, but I think might, might be worth coming back to. Uh, what we have not done so effectively... Um, in my view, is uh, tackle indoor air pollution. And since that's where 80% of when pe where people spend their time in industrialised countries, that's a major issue. But largely the problem there is one of we don't know what to do yet. The science is not settled. Whereas for outdoor air pollution, we do know what to do. And I think a lot of it is about accelerating down the curve, doing things that we know will work, including, for example, speeding up electrification of vehicles, uh, and a variety of other things I go through in some for the, detail. For the lay person listening then, uh, what, what's a driver of indoor air pollution? Well, indoor air pollution has got, essentially, it's got, uh, it's got three kind of drivers. It's got the stuff coming in from the outdoors, and that's why tackling outdoor air pollution is essential, because unless you've got that, you open the windows, things get worse. It's got indoor air pollution created in the home, and that can be as simple as things like the wrong sorts of air fresheners. People want to know that. I see. Uh, but then there's also ventilation. And here we've got a significant challenge because we both want to have good ventilation. It's good for reducing air pollution. It's good for reducing infection and a variety of other things. But we also want to retain heat, particularly in winter, to reduce our carbon footprint, to reduce people's bills. And those two are potentially in conflict. And we've therefore got to find engineering solutions back to engineers, to actually get those two resolved so that we can simultaneously uh, have good ventilation to reduce air pollution and retain heat. That is a, that is a manageable um, uh, engineering challenge, but it's, it's one we haven't fully resolved at this point. Okay. Just finally then, Jonathan Maron, um, obviously the CMO can talk of, and, and does the big picture in his annual report. One of the things that your organisation is doing is working with our integrated care systems. How much of a focus do you push through those local systems in the uh, in judging their work on tackling poor air quality? So we've been working uh, with the SSS through uh, our regional directors and our national teams really to kind of put uh, prevention at the heart of their agenda. I think it's really encouraging to see just how far uh, the ICS uh, leadership are, are taking uh, prevention. I think we have probably focused much more on secondary prevention to date. You know, what is it the NHS can do? Uh, can we really make sure we do the basics right? How, have we found the people? with hypertension, are they effectively managed, are reducing the risk of stroke or heart disease. Well, I think we're then in our broader conversation with local government, we are interested in what are the policies that help reduce air pollution, uh, how can we work on uh, planning, uh, traffic schemes, uh, the broader range of things that may help locally, as well as, of course, supporting CMO in this broader drive to have uh, better solutions and uh, less pollution created by transport over the longer term. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm going to bring in uh, colleagues now, and we'll go around the table to James Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr. <coughs> Whitty, I thought it was interesting in your initial exposition that you didn't mention mental health uh, in relation to prevention. It was all about physical health. Um, what am I to read into that? <laughs> so I think that the um, area of mental health... So if you think about prevention of, of d disease... I think we have a very good idea about how to reduce um, many cancers, cardiovascular disease, for example. Uh, we have much less of an idea about how to do this in mental health, but there are things we do know do work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Dr. Grucci and I uh, worked with the Royal College of Psychiatrists and others to actually try to identify which areas we already have evidence of 
uh, it, things we can actually improve um, the rates of people getting uh, <coughs> mental ill health, or if they have them, how frequently they then relapse and come back, because that's often for many severe, particularly severe mental uh, illnesses, uh, these are relapsing remitting uh, conditions. But I think we should be clear that although there are some things that we know work, uh, the list is much less secure for mental health mm -hmm. than it is uh, for physical health. Uh, my view very firmly is that there probably are many things we can do, but they have not yet been identified. And I think this, is, this should be a major area of research, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't get on and do the things that we know do work at this stage. So on that, the <coughs> historically, um, during the period 2010-2015, there was um, the first time ever the formulation of a five-year forward view for mental health, including um, stuff to do with prevention. Now, the government launched um, a 10-year plan consultation last year, um, but now has now said it's going to fold it all into the major conditions strategy. So in terms of prevention of mental health, what do you think about that? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, from my point of view, in a sense, the vehicle that ministers choose to kind of package things in, I think, is very much one for them uh, rather than for me. What I certainly think we should definitely not lose sight of is the fact that mental health is, in relative terms, increasing in importance. Uh, and therefore, preventing this is, is getting more important as time goes by. Now, no, this isn't necessarily an absolute increase in mental health problems, <clears throat> although we definitely had that for some people during the, uh, the lockdown period, which might be worth coming back to. Mm. Um, but uh, what, because physical health has improved so much in many areas due to prevention as much, in, in large part, uh, the relative contribution of mental health uh, issues is much greater than it would have been 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, so therefore, getting this being lost would be disastrous. Uh, and I think within that, we know that the mental health service is one of the most stretched within the NHS. So the treatment end of it is uh, probably one of the most stretched areas of the NHS before we get to the fact that the prevention is much less well evidenced. So I'm going to ask Janelle in a second to, if that would be helpful to go through some of the things we did with the Ross College of Psychiatrists. Um, but the, the, my view on this is the most important period that we need to be concentrating on is uh, children from sort of mid-childhood through to the middle of their first, uh, their, their mid-twenties. Because the majority of people who have mental health problems, mm. they will first emerge during that period. Mm. Just before we go on to that, could I just, on the, on the issue to do with the interrelationship between mental and physical health, obviously there's often complex dependencies. Isn't one of the issues that kind of prevention pathways within our health system are still predominantly about physical um, health and that the mental health causality is often not addressed as part of that pathway, if that's the right way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and of course, they go in both directions. So um, people with physical health problems are more likely to have mental health problems. And that goes right back to um, pre the prenatal uh, period. Uh, equally, people who have existing living with mental health uh, conditions can very often have much higher rates of physical ill health. People with severe mental health uh, conditions very often die much earlier, not directly of mental health issues, but because they have greater rates of cardiovascular disease or cancers or other things. So the, this, this interrelationship between physical and mental health is complex and bidirectional, as you imply. Mm -hmm. Janelle, do you want to talk about the um, work we've done? Yeah, society? so <clears throat> I think to echo what Chris has said about that interrelationship between mental uh, poor health or mental disorders and physical health, it's, it's really important. Um, so we know that mental disorders contribute about 21% of uh, burden, the global burden of disease for uh, England. So that's quite a large proportion of that. So when we're looking at uh, tackling healthy life expectancy. Mental health absolutely is a large part of that. Um, and as Chris said, the majority of those uh, disorders over a lifetime, mental disorders, start in um, childhood, young adulthood. And so the work around prevention is really, really important and de developing that evidence base around prevention. So we did the work um, looking at the state of the evidence base. Um, and where, where we had stronger evidence. And so um, you know, looking at perinatal interventions, looking at um, interventions with parents, these are strong parenting programs, home, um, home visiting or um, 
the home visiting and parenting programs, but then also school-based interventions, uh, looking at things like bullying in schools, workplace interventions. And by, by describing that um, you know, around schools, around workplace, um, you can see that what, we, what you have to look at is across different sectors. So it's, it's, it's very much where we have to work across government, uh, both national but also local, to look at ways in which we can um, prevent mental disorder. So I think that what, what we do in, in terms of OHID is looking at that evidence base and then sharing it um, and the ways in which we, we share that across uh, government, different departments, but also in terms of local uh, systems, the RCSs, but also local government. Just a, a, a kind of final question, but in terms of when you talked about 21% of the disease burden, as it were, I think that is a recognised figure. But if you look at the amount of money that is spent on mental health prevention, research and whatever, it's minuscule, really. I mean, I think we spend, what, 12, 13 billion pounds a year on mental health services with the NHS. That's for everything, not, not specifically prevention. Do you think that balance needs to change? I, I'm kind of looking at the entire... We, we can, we, why don't we all give a view on that? Because I think, I think we would all have quite strong views on this. So my view is, firstly, on the research side, I think there's a lot more we could do. It's been left behind for a long time. And I d did a report with Paul Farmer, who was then in, uh, CEO of Mind, uh, some about four, four years ago, running through why were the, what were the reasons why this had not happened and where were the areas we could improve. <coughs> there really is a lot we can do on the research side. Jonathan, you might want to talk about the NHS a bit. Yeah, so on the NHS, so I think uh, the NHS has recognised the need to put more money to mental health. The long-term plan set out uh, an investment standard that mental health service would grow more quickly than the rest of the health service, and that indeed has happened. I think the numbers are back in 2015-16, we spent about £11 billion on mental health. By the end of 21-22, that was up to 15 billion, and then of course 500 million extra was made available during uh, the pandemic to try and help improve those services. So I think uh, very clear investment in mental health care, um, both in terms of the services for severe and acute mental health, but also much broader access to psychological therapies, which is reaching a much wider range of people, uh, and some interesting work trying to put uh, dedicated teams into schools, where I think we have over 300 teams now. So I think a real sense to try and grow that. Uh, and then OHID has also tried to do some interesting things. Our uh, uh, behavioural programme unit that uh, runs uh, campaigns and uh, tools for the public uh, produced uh, the Better Every Mind Matter campaigns as part of our Better Health programme. That uh, has a, a health and wellbeing plan that you can download and follow. Um, 4.6 million people have done that. Two out of three of them say that it's led to improvements in their health and wellbeing. So maybe at that very early stage, rather than treating severe illness, but we are trying to find ways of how do we have... Uh, you know, a broader conversation about mental good health as well as mental ill health and are there practical things we can do to help people uh, tackle these problems. But I, can I just add to that? I mean, mental health colleagues very often talk about parity of esteem mm -hmm. and they're doing that not because they think that they're too high. <laughs> they think that there is a, a, an underinvestment and underappreciation of the importance of what they do and I think most people would share that view. I think it is absolutely central. Thank you very much. Right, Rachel Maskell. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Whitty, I want to ask you a question. I've heard you say a few times today um, there are things we can do or we'll do things, but um, whether we look at smoking, alcohol, drug use, gambling and so on, um, you've also drawn out how there are targeted um, marketing but also by companies, but also we've seen um, a, a greater prevalence within areas of socio-economic deprivation. And my question is really about going slightly more upstream. So rather than targeting particular behaviours resultant, what are the stress factors that we're looking at which are driving people into taking up lifestyle choices which are going to harm their health? There is, yeah, the reason why... Um, <coughs> uh, so I think there are, there, are, there are slightly different situations if you're talking about... I'll take three examples uh, where deprivation is very clearly linked to uh, worse health. Um, in the case of, uh, let's start off with the case of um, people living with obesity, which undoubtedly is heavily segregated that way. Um, this is often rather unhelpfully framed as a, well, people just making individual choices. Actually, if you go to the areas where levels of, of obesity, people living with obesity are much higher, the range of choices people have, both in terms of what they can eat, 
where they can exercise a whole variety of other choices are very, very heavily constrained. And uh, you, you still have a situation where people uh, are <coughs> essentially, you, you, you might, for example, go over to High Street, one chicken shop after another. No, that's not to single out chicken shops particularly, but just to make the point that the range of choices that are available in much more affluent areas are simply not there, and the facilities are simply not there. Then you actually have the reality that um, the uh, marketing from some companies, and I will, will pick out the cigarette industry, uh, clearly is marketed heavily at people living in areas of deprivation because that is where they get their custom. You can see that from the numbers. They go for people in areas of deprivation, they go for, 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 for teenagers. That is their, that is their model. Uh, and so it's not therefore surprising if there's very heavily marketing by some of the most sophisticated marketing companies in the world that you end up uh, in the situation you do. And then the final thing is that you, what you have for many of these uh, uh, people is multiple hits throughout their life. And if you look, just to go back to the example of the Blackpool, if you look at a map of Blackpool aged about four, the ill health is distributed relatively evenly across the city. By the age of 10, you already see really heavy concentrations of ill health uh, in particular parts of the, uh, of the city, which then maintain for the rest of someone's life. And the, the people who die early come live in those same areas of the, uh, the, 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 the city. What I think this means uh, for us in prevention terms, therefore, is we know where the problems are. You can see them on a map flashing very, very firmly. And the same areas that were affected by COVID were affected by, are affected by obesity and Depressingly, if you go back to the 1860s, the same areas very often had the highest child mortality. So these are areas which have got deeply entrenched health deprivation, but therefore we know where we are. Those are the areas we should go to intervene because these are identifiable and we should be able to therefore say, yeah, this is where the big preventable problems are. Let's put, them, put the biggest great of, uh, amount of our effort into these areas because this actually is where the problems are going to be uh, fixable most quickly. Thank you. And I, I completely concur with that. And in my constituency, we have a 10-year life mortality um, differential, so I, I certainly recognise that. Um, I'm particularly interested, um, building on, on the things that you've highlighted, about the roles of local government in being able to bring out sizable change. And it seems to me that, I mean, if we look, we're still waiting for the public health grant this year, um, one year grant funding. So we're not really thinking ahead and really bringing in the seismic change which is needed to address these inequalities. And of course, we only have 5% spent of the health budget on public health. So what changes need to be made to really drive that focus on those communities which are pla placed in a place of deprivation because of the, the system, because of the, the circumstances around us? And how do we lift the priority and the work of, for instance, directors of public health to have more force within the local government environment? Well, I'll ask Arthur de Grouchy to come in a second because she was a director of public health until very recently. So I think she's in a very strong position to give her own experience of that. Um, I think the issue, I mean, we still have not got the public health grant quite over the line. I'm hoping that's coming very soon. Uh, but I think we would all accept that uh, local authorities, in my experience, and I see a lot of them around the country, do an absolutely extraordinary amount of work with the resources they have. I think with more resources, I think all of them say they could do more. But they're very inventive in the way that they try to create the healthiest environment for their citizens. And they are usually very good at understanding exactly what the local problems are down to the individual street level uh, and trying to improve on those. Uh, but I think there is a lot more we could do locally. And I think most of us welcome the fact that public health went back into local authorities. I think that has, has many advantages. Uh, but of course, they, they do then need to have the resources uh, and the political, also the political buy-in uh, to be able to do stuff. Again, going back to the point, you need resource and you need political uh, buy-in as well. Janelle, do you want to talk from your experience? Yeah, so I think um, it's very much Chris has laid out how um, the places that where we live um, and where we go to school and um, the houses we live in and, and the nature of our communities in terms of the housing, whether we can walk and cycle, be active, um, access to healthier food or what kind of food offer there is, uh, air quality, all of that is 
as you know, really important in terms of our health and well-being, and it really impacts in terms of those conditions that we're talking about, you know, whether you are more at risk of cardiovascular disease or cancer, and drives that um, increased mortality in particular, uh, young early mortality in particular areas, so that um, life expectancy gap between some areas and others. Mm -hmm. And it really makes a big difference. So um, if we take, we talked about how um, the hot food takeaways in deprived areas, there would be five times hot food takeaways in more deprived areas than in uh, more affluent areas. And so your access to a health, healthy food choice is um, more limited. Or um, you, we know that the 20% of most uh, affluent wards have considerable more um, access to green spaces. So just your mental health well-being, being able to be active than if you lived in a more uh, deprived areas where your access to a garden is just not there. So all of that, I think, is, is really important. And so the reason I've gone into a bit of detail is because I think prevention and primary prevention really does um, go across government. It's a lot of sectors. And in a, in a local area that comes together in a local council, um, directors of public health, but working with, with other public sector um, and private sector um, bodies will, will be shaping that environment. And I think that's really important. Um, there are, sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to yeah. pick you up on a, a point, and it is to do with the funding. Because if we are talking about year by year funding, at such a minimum level as well. And as we say, six weeks' time, the public health grant hasn't yet been delivered. We cannot build a sustained agenda to bring about the changes which are required and the strategy. We've got a fantastic director of public health in York, but just not being able to plan and be able to commission those services and to bring about that change is a real frustration. So I want you to take that back, but also I think we really need to think long-term about how we turn this ship around in those areas of greatest deprivation and need. Do you know I talk to the directors of public health the whole time, so I'm very aware of their views, mm -hmm. uh, which I think are entirely reasonable. OK, thank you, Rachel. Um, we're going to try and stick to sort of 10-minute slots per colleague or 20 for the next, because it's two colleagues together on similar topics, and that way we then get everybody in just as a, a public health warning for my colleagues. <laughs> um, starting uh, with exemplary performance uh, from Lucy Allen and Martin Day, starting with Thank Lucy. you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, for being so passionate about health inequalities, because uh, ever since I've been in Parliament, I've heard politicians talking about the impact on healthy lifespan and in terms of um, actual lifespan as well. And what's frustrated me most is that in 2016, Theresa May stood on the steps of Downing Street and said narrowing health inequalities was her top priority. In 2022, Sajid Javid, then Health Secretary, talked to the Royal College of Physicians and said that that was his priority. All politicians are committed to this. So what are we doing wrong that these red spots are flashing on the maps that you were talking to in your opening address? Uh, well, I'd, I'd first of all like to um, do part, part of my job, which is depoliticise this, <laughs> by making clear that these uh, red flashing areas on the, on the maps have been through parties of multiple colours over long periods of time. I think a lot of public health has so whereas curative services you can move stuff around really quite quickly and I'm a jobbing NHS doctor I know how you can shift stuff around I know that uh, other people have been NHS workers as part of their careers uh, around the table as well public health has to be seen as quite a long-term uh, strand and I think one of the things that this committee can help do is create in a sense a uh, bipartisan view about these are the fundamental things, there will be areas of disagreement, but here are some fundamental things everybody agrees on, and the baton needs to be passed from hand to hand, uh, irrespective of who stands on the steps of Downing Street, quite sincerely intending to try and improve the situation. Because these problems can be done if they are salami sliced away, and this is the point I made about the cardiovascular work, the, for example, the improvements on air pollution, the improvements on smoking, have been large numbers of small changes, one made after another, and each one contributes 3%, but 103% adds up to a very significant shift uh, in risk. And so what we should be doing is, is essentially assembling all the things we can do, and hopefully over this year you will do that, and say, look, there's actually pretty good agreement around this all the tables on this, let's get together and say these are going to happen kind of irrespective of who is actually in power 
because the danger is otherwise what you get is prioritization moving around and that's no one's fault that's not a that's not a criticism at all it's just to make the point that these are these should be seen as long term bets rather than things you're going to get an immediate turn and turn on a sixpence is the gap widening are we getting worse health inequalities but that's being masked because health generally as a population is improving, but the inequality element is, is getting worse. Is that your view? There is a, well, there are certainly parts of the country where health inequalities are getting bigger. Uh, it's not across the whole country. So this is, I mean, health is, is in terms of inequalities, health is quite local. Uh, and the variety can be quite considerable. And all of you as, con as constituents and MPs will know there's a, a variety of areas within your own uh, boundaries, uh, generally. Uh, so it is quite local, but in some areas it is undoubtedly getting worse. It is getting more. Uh, there are going to be bigger disparities between the, uh, the the least healthy and the most healthy. The ones that worry me most are not ones where the most healthy are getting even healthier. It's where the least healthy are getting even unhealthier. That really is the one where that kind of is going against all uh, all of what all of us would want to see. That's very helpful. Uh, you mentioned something about um, prevention being a long term something that. 10 to 20 years to see something coming through. But I'm just wondering if you could perhaps sort of talk a little bit about um, how we change that mindset, because if we can get people to think about short-term uh, benefits, they're going to be more likely um, to, to implement those changes. We had Professor Chappelle, the Chief Scientific Advisor, giving us evidence on this a few weeks ago, and she said that we've got to shift the mindset of thinking prevention something to do with the long-term future and make it relevant to now. So how do we make prevention relevant to now? Well, I think what we should do, I mean, and, and I'm going to be deliberately slightly simplistic on this, and apologies, I'm, not, I'm just trying to make the point, um, is there are some bits of uh, public health, particularly when it comes to capital infrastructure, where you may get a relatively small uh, improvement per year, but once it's there, it's there forever. Uh, and that might be a legislative change or it might be a cycle lane, but this is something where actually you're seeing this as having a huge long-term impact. And then there are some things which are really quite fast. So, for example, when the ban on uh, smoking in uh, indoors public areas came in, there was a very rapid reduction in heart, uh, heart attacks uh, going, presenting in hospital. Within a year, you were seeing uh, very significant reductions. If you put someone, that's in the primary prevention that space, if you put someone who's at risk of a stroke, who's hypertensive and on antihypertensive, the curves, the sort of the curves on a graph between those who are on treatment and those who aren't, start to separate within six weeks. So you actually can start to see improvements really very rapidly, and of course they compound what they compound very many of them. So you can actually over time have really very large changes. So I think what we shouldn't see, and I think people wrongly think, is that well I'm going to do all this investment now, but we won't see an, a, a, an improvement for 20 years. There are some things where that is probably true, particularly improvements in health in young adults who are otherwise healthy. But for very many of the improvements. Uh, particularly in later life, uh, or in people who've already got risk factors, for example, mental health, to go back to the first set of questions, the impacts can actually be really quite rapid, and I think we should, we should see that. And most practitioners, I think, would agree with that, that the, the impacts can be really within months to years, to a small number of years. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, I wonder if I could just ask you about the, um, the Office of Health Improvement and what has been done to tackle health disparities. I think the... The Office of Health Improvement Disparities created um, October 21, so a, a really deliberate decision to try and um, bring the public health professionals that have been in Public Health England and the policymakers that have been in the Department of Health together into one team. Um, you know, ran through quite a, a long process of consultation and, and quite a deliberate set. I think uh, we, we all accepted that that's, that was quite a big change for a lot of people and a real trade between a sort of set of independents, which have been very, very important. Um, to coming inside, hopefully to have more influence and impact. So I think what we have tried to do is organise ourselves to be uh, in the conversations about how to tackle inequalities, not as an outside external body, but as part of Sajid Javid's team, uh, Steve Barclay's team, actually working across Whitehall, mm -hmm. uh, lots of work with the Home Office. So I think uh, in terms of what have we done, um, we've aimed to put the evidence, uh, the best advice, the opportunities in front of our ministerial teams, and actually we've made some, some really good progress. I mean, the obesity work, uh, which got lots of attention over the autumn period, actually, uh, calorie labelling and menus came in in the summer. The restrictions on uh, uh, 
uh, product placement in supermarkets uh, came in in October. I mean, really big change. I mean, I, I don't know where you put my shopping. If I need to the supermarket to buy, I don't know, Lural or whatever, those Mr. Kipling cakes on the end of the aisle, they were always very tempting, and they've gone. Uh, <laughs> if I'm buying the cakes, I know where they are, so that, that's kind of okay. So the, we just big change. Uh, we're still working on advertising. So look, uh, I think there are quite significant changes that have happened, and part of that's been that we've had the people in the organisation that have been able to have... Uh, the conversation with ministers uh, with others about how we do that. And that cross-departmental work is actually going on because yes. cause it's not just about calorie counting. No, 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 no. It's, no, no, about, they, uh, it's I, about housing and planning uh, and um, how we have our road system so that we, we walk and cycle. And Absolutely. And look, I, I chose the, uh, the obesity uh, examples partly because I, mean, I think the coverage at the time suggested we weren't doing anything at all and I, I think you know, the newspapers always uh, veer in one direction, don't they? Um, but not much wider work done on uh, Chris's work on air pollution. Of course, we worked across Whitehall uh, looking at uh, work on that. Uh, we've got work on rough sleepers with uh, the uh, uh, Department for Local Government. We're working really hard with uh, the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office on drugs. And you know, some of really, our drug users are really marginalised community. And then we do a lot to help with their health and lots of uh, investment going there. So I think a, a really broad base, uh, base to our work. Uh, uh, DCMS and gambling, uh, obviously they're not far away from their white paper, we hope. So I think uh, bringing us in has definitely given better access to our public health specialists, to the policy makers in government, which I think is a good thing. And Janelle and I have tried to uh, do a sort of lead, oh, in a, in a co-lead, to show that there's, there's both the policy tradition and the public health professionals. And I think doing that together gives us something that we haven't had before in government. Could I just add one thing to that? I mean, just a slightly more sharpish one. Uh, the problem for many of these, problem, these issues is that the, um, the bad side of things going badly for public health ends up in health, but the cost of solving it is in a different department. Yeah. So let's say transport, the cost of actually putting in cycle lanes, the cost of doing all things is in the transport, both political cost and financial cost. The same would be true for DEFRA for some of the air quality issues. And really, only at the end of the day, Treasury and Number 10 can actually say, this is a whole of government problem, and we need to bring that together. Yeah. So it is important for us to work with our colleagues, and we do work, I, I've been very recently on, on air pollution, on with transport and DEFRA, but this has to be, these problems are whole of government problems. They're not, they shouldn't be seen as just a Department of Health problem. Very important point, thank you for that. That, that is why, Chris, we have you at the start of this inquiry, because you are the government's independent advisor, and you know you are, yes, your secretariat, I suppose, comes through the Department of Health and Social Care, but you, um, you, know, you work cross government. I remember as a minister working with, with you and uh, your predecessor, in other depart within other departments, and that you know this this inquiry most certainly looks beyond our realm as a select committee because it would be it wouldn't be credible if it didn't. But so thank you for saying that; it really helps us. <laughs> uh, so Martin Day, connected subjects. Yeah, yeah, uh, very much on the same territory as, as Lucy's been on. I, I take a great interest in food standards and health and how it impacts on obesity. So I think that there's a lot there, and, and I'm very concerned, obviously, about childhood obesity in particular. And you've spoken about how hardwired the deprivation seems to be in health there, which is is flabbergasting to think that you could trace that back to the 1800s in some areas. Um, now, my colleagues up in Edinburgh and the Scottish Government are trying to half childhood obesity by 2030, and it, it seems to me dealing only with the consequences of poor diet and higher weight isn't, isn't enough. We need to tackle poverty, and poverty is, is such an underlying factor. But as you've quite rightly said, that requires often a political decision. So I'll not ask you to make a political comment, but one of the areas that I was interested in was Dable Dimbleby's national food strategy. And I wonder if you would comment on the main components of that and how rapidly we would see an impact if we were to go down the different avenues of that. Um, you know, he obviously promoted the expansion of free school meal programme for those on universal credit to tackle food, food poverty and unhealthy eating. It covered expanding sugar and salt taxes to fund fresh fruit and vegetables for low-income families, something I would personally favour. Uh, and it also called for a 30% cut in meat consumption uh, inside a decade, which would be a big cultural change, I think, that we would need to pull off. What, how do each of those three factors, how rapidly would we see an impact from each of them is what I'm asking. Uh, thank you. Well, so, um, I mean, firstly, just to acknowledge the uh, really great work that is done in Scotland, although I'm speaking just on England, I'm, I'm the CMO for England, I, I talk every week, and often more than that, 
to uh, my opposite number, Dr. Gregor Smith and his, uh, his colleagues, Professor Gregor Smith, as he now is actually, Professor Sir Gregor Smith, um, uh, fantastic uh, public health colleagues in Scotland. And we learn a lot because actually Scotland has blazed a trail in many areas of public health that we've learned from. I hope the same is also true in the other direction. So there is uh, learning between the four nations of the UK. Um, in terms of the, the Dimbleby uh, report, I thought uh, it was unfortunate to land at a particular point when it was politically quite difficult, I think, to give it the, the concentration it deserved. And I think having a second look at this in this committee would, in fact, be something which would be really valuable. I would also commend the Khan review on smoking. I thought both of those were excellent reports mm. uh, and actually deserved uh, a bit of time and political consideration as to what are the things which are doable now and what aren't. Mm. Uh, certainly, I consider things of taxation are clearly absolutely for political leaders to take decisions on rather than public health people we can say what we think the impact would be but just to take the uh, soft drink uh, soft drinks uh, le uh, levy on sugar that was an extraordinarily successful uh, policy it led to a 34% uh, reduction in sugar while sales actually slightly increased in every single uh, segment of society so there's something where actually mm -hmm. everyone wins the, yeah. there's no disadvantage to the, the marketplace and the amount of sugar in the system significantly goes down. It was a well-designed intervention that essentially incentivised people to reformulate. There are many things which could be done, and this is the key, is to incentivise people to reformulate. It's not to reduce choices uh, and then to provide a level playing field. And it's quite interesting talking to industry, uh, which we obviously do, uh, that you, you, we, we, and I've, I've been quite struck by how many of the political leaders are expecting industry to say, please give us no more regulations, no regulations. And quite the reverse, what industry says is we quite like to do this, but if you don't put a regulation in place, our, our competitors will try and undercut us. So the regulation is simply there to allow the people who want to do it to do so without a competitive disadvantage in the marketplace. So there are a lot of things that can be done that work with the, in a sense, with the trend of the market to reduce calories, to take that example, uh, from the menu across a whole range of different things. I'm talking the menu, I'm not talking about in a, in, a, in a sort of restaurant sense, in the sense of what everyone eats. But, and there's a big but to this, we have to be very careful that in doing so we don't uh, make um, uh, food more expensive for the, for the least uh, wealthy in society. So getting the balance between a more nutritious diet and one that doesn't become more expensive is absolutely critical. We've got to get that balance right because pushing people into food poverty would be the, would be the reverse of a good public health intervention. So that's an example where you know, a crude approach to it would probably do some good but also do some harm and working with uh, industry but also thinking th seriously through the poverty implications is likely to be far more effective. Uh, but as I say, regulation has a very major place and that clearly has to be something for political leaders uh, to make a call on. Thank you very much for that. My other area sort of question, again, it, it, it's one that requires a political decision, so but I don't expect you to, as I say, give a political answer, but it seems to me that advertising must affect public outcome and what, what they expect to get. And, and, you know, we've not had the buy one, get one free deals on junk food banned and the 9pm watershed on advertising, and advertising something that Scotland doesn't control, so I need colleagues here to, to, to grab this one and, and do something. Um, how much of an impact do you think advertising actually has on people making poorer choices? Well, I mean, if advertising didn't make uh, an effect on people's behaviours, then people wouldn't pay the very large sums they do for it. I mean, that's a self-evidently true statement. Uh, and so um, things which actually affect advertising are particularly advertising aimed at children. And I think this is the, the area where my colleagues and I feel very strongly is children, you know, not they are, we as society accept that we as the ad adults, particularly the younger children, are taking choices for them. Advertising at children is, in a sense, undermining that principle. And I do think uh, there is generally consensus about the fact we need to do something about it. I think uh, I'm reminded of the St. Augustine thing, O oh, Lord, make me holy, but not yet, mm. uh, approach. There is a slight tendency for this, this particular can to be kicked down the road for a variety of reasons. Uh, my view is firmly that we should be taking uh, this, some, this thing seriously because there is, I think, support around the political system for it. It's to do with the timing, and I think accelerating the timing, to me, seems a good public health intervention that runs very much with the grain of most people's philosophy, irrespective of where they sit on the political spectrum. 
Excellent. A St. Augustine quote in our select committee doesn't happen every day. <laughs> for that CMO. Uh, Paul Blomfield. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Steve. Um, I'm interested in how we anticipate future risk. Um, so we talked a lot this morning about obesity. We weren't talking much about obesity when it wasn't a problem or when it was only an emerging problem um, in the past. Um, as an example, I mean, Jonathan's mentioned gambling. There was an NHS statement on the Today programme this morning um, about the problem with gambling addiction. We know that online gambling is bringing about a generation of young gamblers, child gamblers, which is kind of creating a potentially massive future problem. Now, so I, I just wondered how you go about, not necessarily on that specific issue, but anticipating future risk. I'll, I'll, I'll do it to future risk, but it might be useful for, jo for Jonathan to comment on the gambling thing, because he's, he's taken a lot of interest in that. In that. Uh, I mean, let's just take a, a, a really obvious example um, of uh, the population ageing. In fact, I'm doing my annual report this year on the ageing society. Um, yeah. you know, everyone knows it's ageing. What I think has been underappreciated in policy terms is it's ageing very, very unevenly across the country. This is true for all four nations in the UK, incidentally, but I'll just take the English data. So in England, people move into cities at 18, usually, for either study or work, and they move out typically after their second child, meaning that the, that the cities maintain their demographics. So Birmingham, Manchester, Newcastle, and London will look very similar in 30 years to what they do now, but the equation has to balance. And therefore, large parts of this, the country are growing older far faster than the average would imply. North, you know, in, in England, that would be North Norfolk, Devon, um, but parts of Cumberland. I mean, those kind of areas outside the city areas, often difficult areas to provide services for, but also difficult to provide some of the preventative services for. Mm -hmm. That's a completely predictable problem, which is going to hit us really hard if we don't deal with it now. And therefore, we need to be planning for that future issue and interesting that's going to change the geography of disease because the big two big drivers of preventable disease tend to be in areas of deprivation and in areas of concentrations of older people yeah. and it's going to shift from some of the typical areas of deprivation inner city areas uh, uh, post-industrial areas increasingly to semi-rural areas uh, coastal areas where in fact you have higher concentrations yes of relative poverty, but also of, of large concentrations of older citizens. So there's just an example of exactly the point you're making, mm -hmm. that you have to think 20 years ahead, 30 years ahead, because a relatively modest change now could have a really big impact over that time frame. If we wait until the problem's on us, uh, it's going to be far more difficult to do, both politically and uh, financially, uh, and the infrastructure will, will simply not be there. Uh, Jonathan, you want to talk about the, the gambling? Yeah, so, so I think... Just before Jonathan oh. comes in, I wonder if I can just press you a little bit on that, because I'm keen to hear mm. um, specifically on gambling. But, um, I mean, that's... Do you think that we are... And that's a great example um, that you gave. But do you think we are sufficiently good at anticipating future risk on a wider scale? I think we are extremely good at anticipating and admiring it and considerably less good at then doing something as a result. <laughs> so, uh, so I think, in a sense, very important in this committee that you both identify the problems, but also, I think, push me and others a bit on, OK, so what are the solutions to that? Because that is the, where the difficult choices come, is what we're going to do about this and having anticipated it. Yeah. Very good. Well, when um, Seymour's last answer, I'm thinking hard of what I say next. Um, so gambling, I think the really interesting thing uh, and there's some generalised points here that there's a really important sort of surveillance and having the data looking at you know, are we seeing harm and we've done lots of work on uh, survey work or just understanding the impact. Uh, so as uh, in this case as the gambling environment has changed we people become more worried about uh, what we're seeing in the surveillance data. PHE actually as our predecessor uh, did some really detailed work on do we understand the evidence of harm in gambling. That's been I think really helpful in uh, gaining attention and people really understanding that actually look whilst uh, many people might have you know, the odd flutter or whatever, it's perfectly harmless. Actually, uh, there's a significant portion of the population that has uh, you know, uh, much more harmful uh, gambling uh, uh, behaviours, and, and we do something about that. So we've worked both on, uh, if you like, the surveillance and the basic data, the evidence of the harm to bring that together, and then also actually to understand the different drivers. So uh, we are expecting a white paper shortly out of DCMS, so it's, it's not my department, so I'm not totally sure of the timeline, but... Uh, we're close, uh, and they're really thinking about, well, what changes do we need in the regulatory environment 
uh, to help make it gambling safer. I think that'll look at everything from you know, the design of games, uh, how do people get uh, the marketing work, uh, and then through to actually, are there, is there more we can do on education um, and uh, perhaps treatment to try and uh, mitigate the effects of some of the harm? So I think a very broad canvas. And, and just to give sort of uh, an easy to understand example here, I think the, people remember the fixed odds betting terminals. Mm. Uh, you know, game, spin around, people were winning uh, large amounts of money. People became very worried about those, very obviously driving a, a, a much higher level of harm. So we changed the. Uh, the government changed the amount you could win, and that's, that's made a massive difference. So I think some of these things are technical. Are the ways the game's structured leading to harm, and can we do that there? Uh, some things about marketing, and then also, have we got the right treatment? So I think the story today was around uh, the NHS. Now got eight uh, specialist regional treatments looking at gambling addiction. Uh, promise to get to 15, hopefully by the end of 2023. So I think, you know, as we've become more aware of the issues, we've also managed to get the treatment moved uh, under a much stronger NHS response than we had five or six years ago. Thanks very much. Um, I wonder if I can ask a, a kind of sort of linked question about um, whole government approach, cross-departmental working. Um, I mean, we, we touched on, uh, just another example, I mean, we touched on mental health earlier and child mental health. Um, I was shocked when I was in UMP going into schools, talking to kids about what they thought my priority should be, that mm. top of their agenda was access to mental health services. But I pushed them further on what the issues were um, that they thought were driving their mental health problems. And I was equally surprised by that because I probably had an old person's view about social <laughs> media and, and, and so on. Um, and they said, no, it, it's actually the pressure that we're under from schools and our parents to achieve academically. Now, how do you open up that discussion um, in, in, in developing a whole government approach? Mm. Uh, well, I'll, I'll have a go at that. I mean, that's not an easy question, actually, because the question about how far schools should push has been, I mean, that goes back centuries, uh, to be honest, um, and exactly what the, the right balance is between going so hard, too hard and going not hard enough. But the schools is the bit which actually is under the control of the state, and therefore the state has to take a view uh, on this. Um, what we know that, just to take the public health approach, we know that, on the one hand, the stresses of being pushed too hard have potential mental health consequences. We also know that there is a very strong correlation between good education and having a long education and having less dementia in later life, just on the public health, leaving aside success and so on. So you do have a balance, even narrowly taking the public health implications of this. Now, this is not one for us as public health people to say that the point along the graph should be here. But it's very much one which I think Department of Education and Government as a whole has to say, at this point in, in history, have we got that balance <coughs> right? And if what we're getting from students is a different a view that things are considerably more stressful than they were maybe when we were all at school, that's probably something for us to listen to and take seriously. I think one of the things you learn very early in public health is listening to what children say themselves is usually a lot more informative than trying to imagine back yourself back to how you were at that age and trying to uh, legislate in good faith uh, on that basis. Things have moved. The, the experience of childhood is quite different now to what it was uh, 20, 30 years ago. Do you think that, um, I mean, we're, we're quite good at beginning to develop cross-departmental working on some of the issues of physical health. I mean, a lot more to be done, clearly, from everything you've said. Do you think that's at the same stage in terms of mental health? No, I don't, I don't think it's anywhere near the same stage. And that's partly because for physical, for certainly for, let's say, exercise, I don't think you'd find anybody in Parliament, I would guess, who doesn't agree that more exercise for children is a good thing and providing them with facilities is a good thing. I mean, I may be wrong, but I had the minority view, that's for sure. And the evidence for that is good, and it runs with this kind of the thrust of what most people believe anyway. For mental health, the evidence is much less strong and the interventions are probably more contested and issues like should we go easier on public exams for example actually has uh, snakes as well as ladders on the on the board mm -hmm. in a way that providing better playing facilities does not so it's a much harder area to deal with but for the reasons that um, mr morris said right at the beginning mm -hmm. you know this is something we're going to have to grapple with because it is an increasing part of the uh, the issues of health in general uh, and I, you know, ultimately, society is represented by Parliament. So I think, at the end, we can provide some bits of the jigsaw. The educationists can provide some jigs bits of the jigsaw. But the decisions have to be taken here in a local government. That's really fundamentally where the final call's got to be made. 
Can I can I add a small just a small? So I, it's, briefly, it's yeah. not a, an answer to the whole question, but just on schools. So the the mental health schools based teams is a joint initiative between the Department of Health and Social Care and the Department for Education. So that did start for a piece of work of you know, the departments together looking at we're not doing enough to provide support to children in our schools and coming up with a, a sort of a joint and jointly managed solution to that. Now we've rolled that out to about I think about a quarter of schools at the moment. The programme is still ongoing. So you know, some start of trying to join up, but I think you're asking a much bigger question than that answers. That's fascinating. Yeah, very briefly, and we're going to well, go to Very Carol. briefly, but a very big question for a, hopefully a brief answer. Um, we're, we're very aware of the enormous scope of this inquiry. What do you think the most effective thing we could do is in terms of our focus? And that's not necessarily what's the most important issue, but what could we most effectively shine a light on? Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to give you two answers, which you can interpret as you wish. The first one uh, is from health improvement, which is the non-communicable side. Uh, the bits of health improvement prevention that can really be decided on by Parliament are primary prevention. So it seems to me, although there's a lot of really important stuff on secondary prevention, that's largely around resource allocation in the NHS. But issues of primary prevention are around society's choices. So given that this is a parliamentary inquiry, my view is the primary prevention questions, the things which society, which Parliament decides, local authorities decide, is a very major issue to uh, consider. The second one, which is on the health uh, protection side, which we haven't talked much about, which is preventing infectious problems, pandemics, and also emergencies like uh, nuclear and chemical and so on. Uh, we just had an example of the power of nature to cause absolutely catastrophic public health implications. Mm -hmm. uh, the past um, experience has been that every time we're in the middle of one, everyone says, why do we not invest properly? Why do we not take this seriously? And between events, people forget how bad it was and disinvest in all these areas and because the most urgent things come up. So I think not forgetting the power of uh, health protection to prevent the worst excesses <coughs> of, uh, of nature in public health for emergencies is possibly another area you might want to go into. As I say, we haven't discussed it so far this morning. I'm, I'm just putting it on the table since you've asked me. Do you mean planetary factors or do you mean uh, COVID? Uh, well, I mean, COVID was an example of that. Of, yeah, there are planetary factors as well, um, but, uh, it's, but and certainly some environmental issues would be in that mm. space. Mm. But I was thinking specifically about emergencies, of which infectious ones are the most common, but you also have to think about the things like nuclear chemical uh, as well as part of this. And just the danger is we always, between events, underinvest, not because we're intending to, everyone agrees it's important, but because urgent things happen and the hospitals are full and the A&Es are there and you, you want to get more ambulances and you want to get more social care and the salami slicing of the public health emergency budget into that. And I'm not saying it's going to happen this time. All I'm, going to say, all I'm saying is historically that is what has always happened between events and like that might be worth something that would be worth just thinking through with, uh, with colleagues when they're witnesses in front of you. Very, very good point. Does previous performance indicate future direction? Question. Uh, Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, uh, Chair. Good morning, uh, Professor Whitty. Um, whose responsibility is it to keep us healthy? Well, I think uh, the, the answer is it's a uh, tripartite um, uh, answer, in my view. I think there's a uh, bit of um, uh, it which is around individuals making their own choices. Everyone would agree with that. Uh, there's a bit of it um, which is around uh, what government can do. And there are situations where people um, think government should do that and situations where people th think government should not do that. And the third bit is uh, the healthcare professionals in the broadest sense. Now, the healthcare professionals bit is the secondary prevention side, and uh, I'll come back to that if you want. But that's the, in a sense, that's the most neatly defined. M my view is that where the, uh, the most people, the revealed preference, and I would take this as what people have historically expected, is where either there's an emergency, there's always been an assumption that government should do something in emergencies, going back millennia, uh, which infectious emergencies are the most obvious, but floods, tragedy of the, uh, the earthquakes in Turkey are examples. How do you recover best from that from health? So that's always been something. Areas where uh, there's, a, there's something that's in common. So for example, air pollution, <coughs> I can't prevent much, certainly outdoor air pollution myself, affecting my family. That's got to be a societal thing. That's either done by 
government representing society was done by nobody. You can't, as an individual, choose the air pollution level you've got. That's a societal choice. And protecting the most vulnerable, so particularly protecting children and pregnant women, uh, and uh, work. Again, long history of you shouldn't die just because you've gone to work that day. And the government has a role in preventing the power imbalance between an employer and an employed, employed person. So if you take an example, um, you know, there, there, and I think that the great majority of things, the average person in the country would be very clear, either I expect government to do this, I expect it to make sure my food is safe, I expect it to keep the air clean, I expect it to make sure that cars are not going to drive into me because they're not properly inspected, or I expect government to stay well out of it. Y yes, a child might fall off a rock side because they've gone rock climbing. That's nothing to do with the state. Y you know, banning sweets is nothing to do with the state. We might want to encourage people to have fewer of them. But so there's a kind of, there's a things which I think my view is the great majority of the public are clear either we want government to intervene or we want government not to intervene. And then there's a small bit in the middle which is contested, which could go either way. And that's where political traditions tend to play, although it's not an obvious right-left one, to be clear. Mm -hmm. It's often much more to do with where people put their balance and you know, the, the relative balance of individual uh, freedom to make your own mistakes against the government's responsibility to uh, put a safety net under people for the most dangerous ones. Uh, it's on both the left and the right of, of politics. That is, so I want to be clear, I don't think this is a, a left-right thing. Um, and I think those are the most difficult ones in, in many ways politically because the, you could answer the question either way. Uh, and often what you're doing is you're trading off very, very difficult uh, um, uh, things in either direction. So I think my view is that's the most difficult area. But nobody would disagree that everybody has an individual responsibility. And of course, no one would disagree that the, pub, the, that the health professions have. That's part of what they're paid for. Thank you. So that's sort of the, the balance between authoritarian and libertarian sort of uh, mindsets. Um, you've talked about the environment that some people are living in, in, in Blackpool was an example that you gave. And you talked about the chicken shops and the difficulties in accessing food or open spaces and such things. But within these areas, there are still people who are living healthy lives. It's, it, it may be more common to be unhealthy, but it isn't universal. So what evidence do we have about what incentivizes or what drives the people who want remain healthy, even within more challenging areas, to remain so? And how can we, we can expand those behaviors, I guess, to a wider population within those, those areas? Okay, well, I'll have a first go on this, and then I'll, I'll maybe ask Janelle to talk about the fact that she's had to do this, live this in as a director of public health and as uh, president of the association of directors of public health. Um, I, I think that the thing which we shouldn't do is assume that the problem that most people have is a lack of knowledge. So the average smoker knows that smoking is bad for them. The average person who is uh, living with obesity knows that that is bad for their health. So it's not that they don't know something. So why have they actually got to that situation? Well, to take those two examples, they have largely got to that situation because that is, the, that is what has been presented to them as attractive choices, either by marketing or simply availability. That is just a reality. So why has the population collectively got a lot heavier over the last 30 years? Is not because humans are different humans to what they were 30 years ago, but the way in which the market is structured and the way they can interact with it has changed over that, time, that period of time. Now, of course, within that, there are individual choices. There are also biological things. Some people have got a different set point in terms of when do they feel full rather than not uh, when they're eating, for example. That's genetically determined as well as socially determined. It's a complex interaction. And then they have the choices that are put in front of them. So these things are always quite complex. I think what we have to work out is when, in a sense, when is the, 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 uh, the plate being so firmly tilted against them that it is the job of society to try and level it a bit and when is it it's just purely a matter of their own choice in which case fine and i think what people the more you look at the reality of it the reality for most people is that their, their choice who are living in more areas of deprivation their choices are quite heavily constrained and it's not fair to say to them well it's all your it's your choice you've chosen to do this when in fact they, the menu of choices they were given was a pretty constrained menu of choices. So I think we have to be honest about with ourselves that for some people the range of choices is far wider than for others and the more constrained people's choices are the more it is reasonable that the state at least asks the question should we actually do something to help 
uh, redress that. That, that. that doesn't answer it. It just simply says that is a legitimate question to ask. Whereas if someone's got an infinite infinity of choices before them, then to some extent that's kind of up to them. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask you about vaping. So, 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 you've talked about tobacco smoking. And we know that we want to stop people smoking tobacco because it's bad for them and makes them die younger of all sorts of different uh, diseases. Um, and so the, this has been invented, this vaping, that you can, um, you can stop smoking more effectively. We believe it's less bad for you. There's evidence that it's less bad for you than smoking. But we also know it's not as good for you as breathing fresh air. Um, and one of my concerns is that something which was supposed to be a stop smoking device, like nicotine gum, has become a fad heavily marketed at children, which is developing an a whole generation of teenagers completely addicted to sucking little nicotine sort of um, coloured pop things. Um, <clears throat> what's your thoughts on the effects on the teenagers' health of this vaping and how do we um, stop them from getting addicted? So I think that um, let's, let's start off with the bits of the, the puzzle that everybody agrees on. And then I'll zero on the bits where I think it's more contested. Because, but I think let's start off with the agreement. Everyone agrees, I think, that uh, it is far safer for someone to vape than to smoke. So if the choice has to be between one or two of those, they're, smoke, they're, they're smoking heavily now, they want to come off smoking, and they can move on to vaping, they can't just go completely stop, then that is a net benefit in health terms. And vaping has an important role as a public health tool to help smokers who are addicted through often no choice of their own at this stage, uh, to come off smoking. So I think, I think everyone agrees with that. Mm -hmm. I think everyone agrees that marketing vaping, a, an addictive product with, as you imply, unknown consequences for developing minds uh, to children is utterly unacceptable. Yet it is happening. There's no doubt it's happening because the, although from a low base, the rates of vaping have doubled in the last couple of years among children. So that is an appalling situation. And then there's a bit in the middle, which is, uh, is it reasonable to have, in any case, flavours and colours that are clearly aimed at essentially encouraging people to vape who may well not be vaping at all? Because absolutely, much rather people don't vape at all than, uh, than not. It's only those who are already smoking where vaping is the route out for them, where vaping has a clear public health goal. So I think that uh, where that leaves us is I think we need to be much more uh, serious in my view, and I know this is very firmly something you have championed and I completely agree with you, that trying everything we can to reduce smoking, uh, sorry, vaping in children as well as smoking in children, both of those are critical, is really important, whilst trying what we can do to make sure that the vaping is available for those for whom that is the route out of smoking, for which it is the best, though by no means a... Uh, um, wholly effective, but by far the best tool for some people. So it's getting that balance right, uh, and there's quite a lot of debate around the country, the, the, the world, how to do this. I think something you have picked up on, Dr. Johnson, and I completely agree with you, is uh, disposable vapes are clearly, for things like Elf Bar, are clearly the kinds of products which look as if they're being marketed in reality at children. Mm -hmm. And I think we should look very seriously at these products for which the child market appears to be the principal market and say, why are we considering this to be a, a good thing to have? Thank you. I'll, I, shall, I, shall, uh, I shall take that as tacit support for my 10-minute rule bill of last week. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, right, Paulette Hamilton. Is it me? It's you. Oh, good morning, um, Sir, Sir Chris Whitty. Um, my question is quite a simple one. While I worked in local government, I did an awful lot of work with public health side by side and in many instances had the pleasure of actually speaking to yourself online and others. The problem I have with OHID, with Public Health England moving into the Department of Health and um, Social Security. I hear what Mr. Moran says about um, the fact that you've got the policy makers. I'm concerned that you're not as reactive, so you're not as proactive, so you're not reacting to things as quickly as you need to. And I'll give an example, or I'll give a couple if it will help. We have an issue with teenage pregnancy now, teenage pregnancy clearly sits within OHID. The problem we then have is 
it also links quite closely with sexual transmitted diseases of young people. Now that's with the Health Security Agency. The question I need to ask to, to get across is, if we truly want prevention, how are these two things lining up? That's my first question. And my second question is, do you agree or disagree with me? And I'm leading that perhaps I'm <laughs> going to do it straight. Thanks, thanks for the hint. <laughs> <laughs> that you, um, I feel with all the changes that have happened since the height of COVID, that you um, have lost your voice and in turn what OHID is doing has, has lost their voice where we want them to be more proactive in what they're doing. And then my last point, because I'm going to do it just, and you can answer as you see fit. I have this thing about the nitri nitrous oxide. You know the thing that young people, they sniff. Oh, yes. And there is, a, there is an absolute clear link that it leads to MS in, in an older age. That's what people are saying, because it strips um, the muscles or something. This is what the research is saying. The problem is at the moment, we cannot get um, OHID or anybody to actually come out and make a clear statement on it. So we see a potential disaster that is happening with our young people going forward. But at the moment, we are absolutely struggling to, to get the powers that be, you guys who have the power, to actually make the clear statement which would help both locally and help us um, as politicians to set a clear direction. Over to you, Dr. Um, Sir okay. Chris Whitty. Thank and you very much. Jonathan. Th thank you very much. Well, what I suggest is I'll, I'll give a couple of answers to that, but actually OHID is very much led by uh, Janelle and Jonathan, so I suggest that they really lead on, on, on this answer. Uh, firstly, um, have we lost our voice? Well, I mean... Uh, I think several people around the table actually would probably argue people like me, not through any tension of our own, had too big a voice in the last two years. So, uh, that, that, I mean, in a sense, that was an atypical period um, uh, of time uh, because there was an emergency. And I think what we're getting back to is a more typical uh, environment. And I personally think that's actually probably quite a good thing uh, overall. Um, but OHID itself, I think, has a bigger voice within government than it did for which the trade is a bit less ability to actually say from the outside government, you're not doing this right, your government, you're not doing that right. That is, that is the reality. That is the trade. And uh, Jonathan has rightly said the positive side of it, which is his job. I'm just making the point that actually there are, in fact, a, there is, there are, you know, there's, there's a balance on this. But I think my view, I have to say independently, is that OHID does have more influence within government than it did when it was part of Public Health England, which was outside. But there is no perfect solution for it, which is why this has moved around at various points. There isn't an absolutely perfect uh, answer to this. In terms of the uh, interaction between teenage pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections, um, well, firstly, there has been, uh, and we should really acknowledge, and this is largely led by education, there has been a significant reduction in teenage pregnancy over time. And that's a real, that's got so many benefits. For, for the women involved, for their children, for long-term things. So that has been a big improvement over some decades. This, again, this has gone over uh, governments of different colours, if I can put it that way. Uh, the link with STIs, um, I mean, the, the recent MPOX uh, um, outbreak we had in the UK demonstrated that STIs are a very serious issue, uh, and sexual behaviour is a part of that. It's part of a more complicated areas. Something I have to remind some of my colleagues is the last really severe um, uh, pandemic we had was HIV, sexually transmitted. So a sexually transmitted route can be a, very, a route to a very serious infection. Uh, uh, and the, some of the earliest bits of the NHS were set up largely to deal with the fact that the UK had a major syphilis problem 100 years ago and needed uh, to deal with that. One in 10 uh, men in London had syphilis, for example. Quite extraordinary when we look back on it. So uh, bringing together the various components I think is critical. I have aligned both to OHID on the non-communicable stuff and to the uh, UK HSA. In fact, my own background, I'm an infectious disease physician uh, by trade, so I very much see the links between these. But I think if you or anyone feels you think there's disconnect between the non-communicable and the communicable, you should flag it, because that is a really serious thing if that goes wrong. 
that was the potent, one of the potential benefits of the PhD system. I have to say, and Jonathan can say whether he agrees, he used to work in it. I'm not sure it always worked, even when they were in the same building. Uh, the philosophies were quite different. So I think I wouldn't say any disconnect is necessarily just due uh, to the fact they're in uh, a building's about five minutes walk away. Uh, I think that, that seems to me probably not the principal uh, reasons for the cultural differences that sometimes arose. Uh, say if you disagree, Jonathan. Janelle, do you want to give an answer? <laughs> Uh, should I go next, Jonathan, and then you come in? Yeah, so I, I think, um, uh, thanks for that. And uh, certainly, I mean, what I would uh, want to do is emphasize the importance of the director of public health role. Um, and we, we've talked about that before, and having been a DPH, and I know um, there's a <coughs> strong D directors of public health in uh, your area as well. Um, and so that, that role of the director of public health is really, really important in, in knowing what the um, what's happening on local um, population, uh, local population health, and where it's uh, the same as national, but also where it might be different and what, what those concerns are. So it's really important. And so um, knowing about that and then thinking about, well, what we can do. And, and local directors of public health are very good at looking across systems um, and ensuring that they can um, provide that system leadership in a local area between council, council services, the services that they commission, so sexual health services, um, with those services um, provided and commission, commissioned and provided through NHS, for example. Um, and so I think ICPs are a real opportunity to look at how can we do this differently, because we know that sexual health reproductive health, um, that, that really this is one area, I think, where we need to do better at integration. Um, and uh, so, so I think that's, that's really important. In terms of OHID, we've got regional directors of public health, um, and I, I di di directly line manage the regional directors of public health, so there will be one in the Midlands. So again, with that um, line of sight as to what's going on in local areas, what, what issues might be arising or particular concern, and then looking for solutions at either regional or local area or um, whatever the, ge the, the geography makes sense. It would just be a nuisance because I've yeah. only got 10 minutes. Okay. But um, my view is I, I feel as if we're losing that independent voice. Mm -hmm. So within your answer, could you just tell me how do you feel going forward we will keep that independent voice so some of those emerging issues is not just tied up within local systems and then it's got it's an emergency as you've talked about or something that has gone wrong we then hear what is going on and the example I gave was that nitrous oxide which is a major issue at the moment in areas like the area I'm from but for some reason we can't get the people above to, to even make a statement on it because if it's happening in Birmingham it's got to be happening elsewhere. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Jonathan shortly, but I think um, for me, it's, it's that, 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 that relationship or, or making sure that we hear what's going on in Birmingham. And as I say, through, I, I think that is really important because then that voice through to the, the regions, but also to national. Chris has mentioned we still have calls with local directors of public health, regular calls, so that we can have that local intelligence. Um, and alert to us. I don't know that specific um, issue that you're highlighting in terms of nitrous oxide. I think we certainly... Why, why, why don't we, we'll, we'll make a guarantee that we will, yeah, we will provide a, a paper on that. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of that, if it's clear enough, if the data's clear enough, we will say something reasonably clear about it. I think it's a very fair challenge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I don't think that's to do with where it sits. I think that's to oh. do with we haven't concentrated on that issue. It's a, it's a good one to raise. Yeah. Should we, did you want to... Very briefly, Jonathan, on, on the nitrous oxide point, or was, was there something else? Uh, so just very briefly, I think just in a minute. There's a couple of things here that. So, whilst we've brought our public health colleagues into the department, we're really clear that we're no change to what they're able to publish. So, we're just going to speak to the evidence, we continue to publish, we produce over 200 statistical reports. So, that, that surveillance function that PHG had, which is really important, stays. Uh, the ability of our professionals to talk about what's happening on the ground stays. Um, but we might be having a slightly different conversation about government policy where we're in the policy discussion rather than trying to influence from outside. So I think that's where we've got a change. I think that's making a difference. Uh, nitrous oxide is something that's live in government. We're talking to the Home Office, the Department of Health. Uh, people share your concerns. But you know, as Chris offers, we're happy to help.
When you say it's a live issue in government, I mean, I, I go out with the litter pickers in my constituency and I constantly find the little capsules that Paulette yeah. is talking about. Yes, and uh, Neil O'Brien's very concerned about them. Right. He's talked to his colleagues in the Home Office. We, you know, it's an issue that people are uh, turning their attention the, to. The chair, and, and thank you all for your responses. That nitrous um, oxide issue, there is a link, if you, I'm a social media yeah. type addict, there is a link that they're saying with MS okay. and the fact that young people are starting to present with early onset of MS. Yes, so that's why I asked the question. Yeah, so back to yourself. Yes, could, could I, could I, sorry, could I just make a very clear point on that? Because I think the point you raised, the nitric oxide is, is, is a good example of this. My view is if the evidence is clear, mm -hmm. you can be inside government or outside government, the evidence yeah. speaks for itself. Where it tends to be more tricky is when the evidence is pretty unclear and there's a certain amount of advocacy involved. But mm. if the evidence is clear, you simply say, well, here's the evidence. And then I think that then leads, then there has to be a response. Either we're not going to ignore it or we're going to do something, but at least that makes it clearer. So I think it's assembling yeah. the evidence we need to do. Okay, great. Homework. Uh, Chris Green. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Whitty, I'm just going to look at uh, town planning uh, for a short while. So a good few years ago, uh, a lot of towns were designed a bit like Milton Keynes. I think as Lucy Allen would highlight, uh, parts of Telford uh, design where it's quite um, an urban sprawl. You've got these roundabouts. It doesn't lend itself to active travel. It doesn't lend itself to good public transport either. And once these things are built, once these towns are built there for decades or hundreds of years in that format, it's very difficult uh, to uh, change them. And at the moment, we're going through a thing where there's a lot of focus on 15-minute cities, which I'm not very comfortable about the certain surveillance aspects and other control aspects, but I'm far more sympathetic to... Uh, everything being in walking distances. So what's your view in terms of these grand designs and sometimes the potential for them going wrong because you don't quite envisage what's coming down the line in a few years? Well, I mean, I, I engage, as, as Janelle does, and, uh, and DPHs definitely do, with, the, for example, the chief planner, a lot, mm -hmm. because you can build in either good health or ill health and as you say, once it's done, it's very difficult to undo. Mm -hmm. And this is true both at the macro level, so planning a, a city or adjusting it as time goes by, and at the micro level. So, for example, one of the reasons we're going to have a problem in the UK as the population gets older is the housing stock is not designed for that. It's designed for young family with two children, uh, largely, and that's going to be very problematic. So people with even moderate disability may not find it easy to live independently. So I'm just using, so the, des the design of the built environment and the, also the natural environment that we maintain within it is absolutely critical for physical and mental that health. That goes in with the point about Manchester, Birmingham, London, maintaining the population age range and more uh, small exactly. towns. And more people, people are going to be moving towards places where the housing stock simply isn't correct as they grow older. And this is going to be a, a very serious problem for us, I think. Um, Within that, of course, all these decisions are, are, are tricky and they cost money or political capital, uh, or both. Uh, but actually, by making a proper build, build, you know, the built in building for health uh, in the long run is a huge investment uh, in the population as a whole. And in, in general, provided it's made clear why it's good for health, mm -hmm. Uh, and the line of sight to and my family's health would be better. My view is actually people do care about this. When it's cr framed in ways that people find, feel that their choices are being taken away from them, that gets a lot more tricky. So I think just to take the 15 minute cities uh, issue, which has become incredibly politically complicated for reasons that are, uh, are multifactorial, let's leave it at that point. The first principle that everyone should be able to if possible, if they wish to, <coughs> walk to the shops, walk to public services, uh, use um, open spaces near where they are, not have to travel long distance for them, mm -hmm. kind of, who's going to argue with that? It's some of the way that you actually, it's then presented, which tends to lead to then the political concerns that some people have, some of which are easier to, I think, fully understand than others, let's put it that, that way. Uh, but, but the general principle that most people would want to live in a livable city that is attractive for them, that allow their children to play, play, that allow their elderly relatives to walk to the shops without having to always get public transport. I don't think there's huge amounts of opposition to that, but there's a cost to it. And that's the trouble, is there's a cost. And particularly, there's a cost um, 
But particularly my worry is that sometimes the cost of one particular segment of society is allowed to get disproportionate weight. So let me just take one example. Mm -hmm. The thing which worries me in London for active transport, as it does in most other cities, is not when there's a conflict between cars and cycles. That needs to be managed. Both need to be uh, dealt with when they're driving. But when there's a conflict between having a cycle, walking and driving, and large numbers of parked vehicles, mm -hmm. taking huge amounts of the road space, mm -hmm. because they happen to provide funds for the local authority yeah. or an individual has got a parking space and they're not going to give it up without a right. Now that car is used hardly at all in reality and yet that's the thing which is causing the conflict between the active transport and the car. Mm. Now that's going to require political bravery to come overcome that but actually once achieved the outcomes are very positive for everybody because the health goes up, the active transport goes up and the uh, people being able to drive as they wish goes up. So a lot of these things, it's about saying where is there an interest which ultimately is, not, is, is disproportionate. And that is fundamentally an issue of politics. That's not a, people like me can say, in principle, you have to actually do what you can to improve it, but that's a political choice, and that has to be argued in the public domain. And that point, I think, lends itself to um, a next concern I have. So the government, quite rightfully, wants more people to walk and cycle to get around. And uh, national government's given uh, uh, the mayor in Greater Manchester, um, Greater Manchester MP, uh, money for the B network. And there are projects which are being designed so you uh, have a better structure for cycling. Um, and I just wonder sometimes whether uh, the focus would be better on sorting out the potholes and that basic maintenance, which is often neglected, so people can see, constituents can see, that there's a substantial amount of money for redesigning an existing, quite reasonably good road when potholes aren't being filled in. I know this is more of a, a transport question, but if it's driven from the centre saying, you've got to really push this active travel agenda, but actually ignores the basics which enable people to cycle, because a deterrent to cycling would be uh, pothole-ridden uh, roads. Oh, I'll give a general thing, and then you might want to talk about Manchester, uh, <coughs> you, since you know it very well. Um, uh, the, the, the issue for, uh, you know, let's take cycling and other forms of active transport. What I really care about as a public health person is not that a middle-aged man who loves cycling goes 110 miles rather than 100 miles. I care that a slightly, uh, beginning to get slightly living with a bit more weight than they'd want, uh, sort of older diabetic woman has the opportunity safely to get from point A to point B by active transport with a whichever f form they choose on the routes that they want to go on. That to me is a huge public health win and I think we often forget that quite short distances of people who are children, people who are older are in public health terms probably more important than having a long cycle route out in the countryside, which is great for people mm -hmm. who are doing it, and I'm all for it, to be clear. I'm not saying those are bad things. Those are really important. Now, if what's stopping them is a pothole, then that's important, because safety is really key, critical to this, and this is my final point mm -hmm. on, on this point, which is what's the disincentive to cycling, apart from people not being able to, so teaching it at school is a really critical thing. Uh, feeling safe on the road is really important, and knowing that you can leave your, your cycle at either end and it's not going to disappear is also important quite reasonably. If you can fix those, a lot of people will use active transport. And if you look back to the 50s, the huge demographic of the UK, older, younger, every generation, all cycled or walked. It's a big shift away from that to cars, mm -hmm. which in public health terms is bad in multiple ways, ranging range from air pollution to lack of exercise. So you know, actually thinking how were these cities until 40 years ago and how can we recreate that seems to me a legitimate thing to actually ask the question. And that's not mainly about potholes. No, I've got, I've got very uh, uh, little time. But my, uh, in Greater Manchester, you've got the Greater Manchester Social Framework which is to set out the, the house building and other things as well, other infrastructure to go along with it. And you look at it and it could be broadly described as a donut around the city of Manchester for executive homes. And uh, these sorts of housing estates and developments don't lend themselves to public transport 
and they don't lend themselves to active travel. They might in the local area, but they certainly don't when you want to go to work. Uh, you've got to get in your car. And there's aspects of, as well, primary schools, for example, uh, the number of, when there's a new primary school development, it's very rarely a new single form entry primary school with a relatively close catchment area. It's often to, and I had a proposal recently in the constituency for three, three form entry primary school. Aren't you demanding if you do that? Coming from um, uh, government, um, all the local authority, the trust and the Department for Education, if you have uh, these sorts of uh, developments, you're requiring people to drive? Or a Manchester person? <laughs> Bri well, briefly, please. Very briefly. I, mean, I suppose I'm um, taken away from uh, Manchester, which, uh, yes, I do. I was a director of public health in Manchester, and I still live in Manchester. Um, but um, I think what we're doing with, with O here, I mean, these are very complex areas. I know the spatial framework and all the uh, political uh, conundrums that were part of mm -hmm. getting that through. But um, I think what we're trying to do with OHID is look at the evidence, look at the evidence base, um, work, uh, in terms of how you can ha have, um, what's the evidence base in terms of health and health promotion of something like active transport or housing, um, and then work with um, the chief planner and DLUC in terms of looking at the national planning policy framework and maybe change, changes that could happen there. How can we um, help and support local areas to have the best way that they can um, understand what those choices are between um, you know, the, the balance, the tensions that are there, but what's the evidence base about what choices that they can make? And I think the, the point in terms of um, the future, future threats, you know, Chris's point about, well, who would have thought the car might have, you know, um, contributed in terms of um, air pollution or uh, increased physical activity. It's trying to think ahead to what are those kinds of towns or places that we want to live in and, and do our, um, something like our planning frameworks really enable local communities to create the best places for for people who live in those, both either through children, through, through the life course, and to being older people, so that people can stay within the communities should they wish to. I, I appreciate the point you've made. My concern is, I, I, I think what you're saying is right, but I think the practices are quite removed from it. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, okay, Paul Bristol. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um... NHS historically has been geared towards episodic care, treatment, tariff is obviously an example. And in local government, political priorities are often, well, public health is not often a political priority, certainly in the immediate term, because you've got local elections and things like that to, to concede with. Do you think that we have the right system in place and the right levers and drivers in order to ensure that appropriate investment is made into public health? Um, my view is that the system is, it, you can change systems infinitely. Uh, my view is that the current ICS ICB model is probably a reasonable one because it brings together local authorities and the NHS in one place and they have not always seen eye to eye. I think that's a safe thing to say. I'm sure all of you have seen this as, as constituency MPs uh, because they do, they both own very major parts of the solutions, on, particularly on prevention, as does central government. So that's essentially the triumvirate of groups that can do something about it. But I think what we've really got to do is make it work. And my worry here, if I'm honest, is that the bits which were not working as well prior to this change could end up with a not working very well ICS, ICB, uh, and the ones that were working incredibly well previously will end up with a very good system. And, and since we won't shift the dial in the areas where there's less good provision. 
So I think what we've really got to do is look at the areas which have historically not done so well at so bringing together. Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to name names on this one, but I think if you look at the map of the country, you can see where the life expectancy is lowest. That doesn't mean that they've necessarily failed, but those are the ones where we really need to put our effort into. They've often been extremely good, actually, but they need the extra effort, and they are really clear to see. You can look at the ONS data on this. It's you can get it down to ward level, and you can see which are the areas which really need the help. And that is not a matter of change in the system. It's about saying we've got to make it be serious about X area. I guess my, my, my question is around um, incentive. And yes, absolutely, you can look at a map, look at a city like mine in Peterborough, and you can look at certain wards in Peterborough. Like Rachel was saying earlier, you know, there are huge um, discrepancies in life expectancy across my city. You know, there's some wards that do exceptionally well and others who don't. It was the same during COVID. Um, but I guess my question is, within the existing systems we have, is, are we going to have an incentive, a situation where the incentive is towards those longer term investment in public health and prevention against, as you were saying earlier, um, ambulance times, waiting lists, the things that kind of keep, I suppose, hospital CEOs awake at night? I, I think that the key is not the structure, and that's my main point, I think. Yeah, I was in Peterborough very recently. I've seen exactly what you're talking about in terms of the extraordinary gradient. And also within the most difficult areas from a health point of view, extraordinary local leadership from local politicians, from GPs, from others who are determined to turn things around. Yeah. But it is almost always an issue about uh, leaders. And I don't mean that in terms of necessarily a political leader, although at the end it has to be uh, judged by political leaders saying, actually, for my area, these are where the priorities are. I'm going to live here for my whole life. I want it in when I, when I retire, when I leave office, whenever it is. I want it to be better for my family and my neighbours than I found it. And the, lead, the local leadership you see is very, very heartening. What, unfortunately, is less heartening is you go to areas which have got serious problems and leadership isn't there. And it's, it's random across the system, unfortunately. And getting good leaders into the areas uh, 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 where we've got the biggest problems seems to me the biggest priority because they will take the risks. And it's about holding the risk and saying, yes, it'll be unpopular for a year or two, but actually viewed over a decade, this can be transformational. And I'm going to hold my nerve. I'm going to keep going because the evidence is very clearly that if we do this, this is going to improve health locally and indeed the local environment. OK, well, and I think the centre you visited in Peterborough is a favourite of mine and my local GP service as well. And they do exceptional work. Do we spend enough money on public health? Well, I would. My view is that we should spend more of the money we spend on health towards prevention, which I think is the point of this whole inquiry. Uh, how much money we put into health is ultimately a political decision, which is why I tend to steer clear of it. Uh, as a health person, obviously, I'm going to be in favour of that but, it's, but that. but the question within the fixed health budget, should more of it go into primary prevention and secondary prevention? My view is yes. But on primary prevention, a lot of the capital to be used up is, in fact, political capital, not money capital. And that's a decision for people around this table, not for me. Do you think it would be wise to divert money from secondary care at hospitals to prevention? I would like people in secondary care to do prevention. In fact, that was the, the chair mentioned an article I wrote in the BMJ earlier this year. Part of my point was, don't just leave this to GPs. This should be everybody's problem. It should be nurses' problems. It should be consultants. You know, I would speak as a secondary consultant myself. We should be thinking when someone comes in, not just about the immediate problem, but also about their blood pressure, about their risk for cancer, and all of these areas. So it's really shifting the emphasis of the health service from a small number of people do the prevention, which is people with public health or primary care in their title, to this is a whole of system problem, which everybody should actually contribute to and make Every, you know, make, make it much more of a sense of this is what the whole system is there to do. There to do. You, you, you can fully appreciate the sensitivities in diverting money away from hospitals, let's say, to deal with a, 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 an immediate problem in hospital into public health or prevention. Uh, well, that, that, but I didn't say that. I know. I know. <laughs> what I said was, uh, within the health service, if you want to be in a situation where you say press and repeat and all the problems we have every winter are the same problem, but they're getting worse because the population is getting older, then the way to do that is not to take public health seriously and not to take prevention seriously. So uh, if you took 100 doctors and 100 nurses and asked them the same question, should more of health money go into prevention?
intervention, I'm confident the overwhelming majority would say yes. This is not a, I happen to be a public health person, I'm also a jobbing NHS consultant. I and my colleagues would all agree, if well targeted, if well evidenced, so not doing faddy things, if well targeted, I think everyone would agree this is the way you stop the hamster wheel going round at an increasingly fast rate. Personally, I agree with you, but I think it's a very, it, it's a very difficult thing to achieve, I think. But we need to, we that to is, change that our is, minds. That is why I'm, we are so fortunate to have bold political leaders who can take these long-term decisions. <laughs> <laughs> See why you've lasted so long, CMO. <laughs> <laughs> um, could I just end by asking you about very upstream prevention, which is one of the things that we, we want to look at in this work. So Genomics PLC uh, sent us a good submission about screening, um, suggesting that it should be much more targeted using genomic data to identify those most at risk. We had a range of submissions calling for genomic testing on conditions such as hemo. Chromatosis, I think I've got that right. Aortic dissection, it's been championed by my colleague from mid Derbyshire, who sadly lost her son to AD and has really led on this, formed a new charity. Cancer, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, you'll be aware of the NHS gallery trial that's being done with the, the organisation Grail, led by Harpal Kumar, who used to run CI UK, of course. Um, that, that is a fascinating um, study in the can detect very early stage cancers from a, a blood draw, a single blood draw. Is that the future of prevention, upstream early detection of cancers, which pancreatic cancer, which you know obviously is very hard to detect in early stages and, and bowel, um, is that the future of prevention when it comes to some of these conditions? So the, the short answer is yes. It's not in every area. So, you know, do I want to detect lung cancer earlier? Absolutely, because the outcomes get better, but not good. Do I want to prevent lung cancer by stopping people smoking? That's clearly far better on lung cancer. But let's take the example you took of pancreatic cancer. There are things you can do to help reduce the risk of it, but still a lot of people will get pancreatic cancer. The earlier you can pick up things like that or esophageal cancer or to take a, one where it makes a huge difference, ovarian cancer, which is usually picked up far too late, uh, and in the major cancers that people will come across friends and family in almost every family, for example, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, the really large ones that are across all of the population, the earlier you pick them up, the smaller the uh, procedure uh, you have to deal with, the less it impacts on people's lives, uh, the less it has long-term effects. There are so many advantages to going upstream. But... There is a danger that if you go upstream with something that isn't very, very specific, just to take the Grail example, and that's still in exploration, we don't know, some of it will work, some of it won't. Let's take prostate cancer. A very large number of people with prostate cancer will die either never knowing they've had it, or it certainly contributes in no way to their poor quality of life or their death in the end of it. What you don't want is large numbers of people diagnosed with things for which they actually uh, early treatment isn't going to help them at all. In fact, they get the disbenefits of treatment, but not the benefits. So, for example, screening for prostate cancer uh, gives you large numbers of men who have the side effects of over-treatment and doesn't improve your quality, of life, your, your quality of outcomes at all at this point. Now, the way we deal with that is to get better testing, better targeting, and this is what the genetic systems are going to allow us. It's going to actually say, you, as an individual are much greater than average risk of diseases 1, 2, and 3, and much lower risk of diseases 4, 5, and 6. And therefore, we're going to put the screening systems on to you much more frequently for the ones you're more likely to have. Actually, we'll do less of the screening for the ones you're less likely to have because we've risk ratified you in a much more sophisticated way. And that is going to be, be possible from here on. Genetics being one, uh, Genomics being one element of that, but not by any means the only one. There are many other ways you can stratify uh, by risk where we actually stratify people's risk and actually intensively uh, follow people for the diseases they're likely to get given their genetic or social uh, environment and much less for the things they're much less likely to get. We already do it a bit by age and gender, but so, so much would it, more sophisticated Would it way. follow then that we would draw back from more population level screening for breast or the FIT test for um, poo in the post? Um, would we draw back from that to then increase the more 
personalised screening because, because, you know, come back to where we started to complete the loop. Um, if we just keep adding more things that the NHS is going to do, then we either just keep increasing the budget and spend more and more on health, and our health spending rises faster than GDP, yep. not a very sustainable place, um, given the workforce challenges we have, or, or are you saying that th this would come on top of everything else that the NHS is currently doing through its screening programmes, for instance? So you, well, f firstly, if you pick something up earlier, you're almost certainly going to lead to less work for the NHS because it's much easier to treat earlier. But that's, a, that's not the, point, the main point you're making. I'm just adding that. Um, let's take the FIT test. If we know that someone has a genetic condition called Lynch syndrome, for example, you'd want to do it more frequently and earlier but there'd be other people at the other end of the spectrum where you think actually we don't need to do it very often at all so we may well be able to balance it pushing it away from the people who really need much less of it and much more towards people who need more of it mm. so let's say breast cancer if you if someone has BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations you'd want them to be screened earlier and more frequently there are other people with no family history and no genetic risks so you might well see really quite infrequent screening is necessary and of course there are some things where by prevention we actually can wind back from it almost entirely. So mm. I anticipate a period where we will, in the future, be able to have minimal or no cervical screening because the vaccination will simply have got rid of yes. the risk. So I would, you know, the, the thing I'd like most is a thing which takes the risk away completely. And then next down, what I'd like to do is target the, what we do more towards those at greater risk and actually do less for those who actually are lower risk because it just doesn't make sense and actually risk benefit, in fact, does not help them particularly and it just uses up resources for no clinical benefit. I think that's a brilliant place to end and uh, it's been a brilliant session to start this prevention inquiry. So uh, thank you so much for your, your time. I hope you follow our deliberations and uh, we will, will. We'll obviously stay in touch with you. So um, Dr Jeanette de Grouchy, uh, Jonathan Marin and Professor Chris Whitty, thanks very much for giving evidence. That concludes the session. Order, order. The proceeding has ended.